You're listening to Protecting What Matters, a podcast by the Ohio Department of Commerce. Commerce is Ohio's chief regulator, and we play a vital role in keeping you safe by protecting your property, your money, and some of the products you use every day. This podcast is designed to bring awareness to important issues and help educate consumers and businesses. Join us as we chat with trusted industry experts focused on providing you with the tools you need to help you protect what matters most in your life. Maybe they do send text message alerts letting you know that your package is arriving or it's on track or something, or maybe they don't, but you wouldn't know that. So a lot of times I always tell people to pay attention to shipping notifications through text because that is where they could really get you. Something just like, issue with product, not, you know, undeliverable, click here or anything like that. And people are quick to be like, oh, I'm expecting holiday stuff. And you're not really thinking like, when did I possibly purchase something or where is this from or what mail carrier is it going to be coming from? So you just click and again, you're opening your, yourself up to any, you know, potential fraud down the line. The holiday season is nearly here, or maybe we're right in the middle of it, depending on when you're listening to this podcast. If you're shopping online or in retail stores, a lot of your personal information is out there right now. Who has it? Who controls it? What can you do to really safeguard yourself as you're finishing up shopping for the holiday season? We are here to help. The Ohio Department of Commerce has the Office of Consumer Affairs, which provides a variety of information and resources with the goal of providing folks like you tools essential to make smart financial decisions. Today, we're going to cover a lot of ground about how you're buying and what you're doing this holiday season. I'm Michaela Hunt with the Ohio Department of Commerce, joined by Victoria Yurkovic, Consumer Affairs Manager with the Division of Financial Institutions. Tis the season to have this conversation, and we actually are recording this kind of early because we need to. I don't know how many shopping days at this moment are left till Christmas, but in, you know, all the holidays, but it's not a lot. No, and it's actually good that we are pushing this out when we are because it has essentially already started. And that's due to inflation costs. So, we are seeing an earlier shopping season because of inflation and supply chain situations. So, you might have seen Christmas decorations already at the end of or end of September early October because retailers don't want to run out of the good stuff. They don't want to come into a situation where they wait too long, then they're out of stock, then they got to wait. And by the time that they're waiting for the, you know, new inventory to come in, people are like over it. I already found something else that I needed or shopped elsewhere. So they've been preparing. Retailers have been preparing for this. They've also been preparing because inflation has been such an issue. They know that people are a little bit stretched right now. So let's start the season a little bit earlier and get folks a little bit more enticed to buy. Also with that, your your discounts. You're seeing more and more discounts. They op, they went after Labor Day. They optimized, you know, with October. They want to kick off before Black Friday and into the holiday season. So because of that, we're seeing more people being drawn to the stores a lot earlier. So inflation, discounts, and also supply chain kind of all contributing to this. I did see something within the last few days. Costco was talking about how they put all of their stuff out so early because they actually had a lot left over from the supply chain that didn't make it to yep. the U.S. shores mm-hmm. last holiday season. So you're seeing a lot of their Christmas stuff right now. You know, we're all pulling out our plastic during this time or cash. Some people still do that, right? But with it, when we're pulling out our plastic or if even if we're using an app to pay for things, what kind of this season um, are some retail trends that could spark those potential shopping risks? How does this tie back in to the holiday season? So because if when you're making your holiday shopping season longer, you're just more prone to risk and fraud because you're giving scammers more opportunity to create situations that entice you. So let's say that they're, you know, folks are saying because we want to have more people buy from our company, they want to create more discount opportunities. That means how do you hear about discounts? A lot of times email, or you're going to be getting, you know, more ads pop up through your social media accounts. So more is thrown at you. When you have more opportunity, that's when scammers optimize off of it. Phishing emails become more prevalent because of it. They're trying to copy the retailers. They're trying to match what's being thrown at consumers right now. 
So you are more likely to not really pay attention and just click because you're being thrown so many new ads. Um, and, and the thing with social media too, like we've seen this transition from especially Instagram and, and, and Facebook, where it's no longer just a platform for pictures and conversations and information, it's now a way to buy directly from them or links. You know, you have a big influencer with a large following, they used to be able to like link their outfits or things that they're purchasing to like a, a different website and you go there and then you, they get some small commission. Well, now they're trying to just directly become e-commerce. So now people are being, you know, drawn in from an ad, they go click, they click, and then it's just taking them to, you know, anywhere and anything. So that's, it's now you're, you're exposing folks to more links that could be not the right website to be directed to. Can we talk about these Instagram ads for a minute sure. and the gifts that we could buy off of them? So I bought a gift and I am now, I, this was an early, very early holiday purchase. So I'm telling you, I bought it in May. I usually don't do my shopping that, that early. early. <laughs> but some of you sometimes throughout the year, like me, you, you see something you know you're going to use for later on in the year. So that's what I did. Uh, specifically an ice cream pan that you can, you know, put milk and sugar in and things like oh, that. Okay. And then you roll it up and it's it really cool. We are now in October as we're taping this and I don't have my pan. Mm. And I bought it off one of those Instagram ads and I gave them my information. I purchased it. I have no product and no one's answering emails. What kind of recourse do I as a consumer have? Even if it's not here with the Department of Commerce, all of us are going to have this question at some point. Well, a lot of times, so that's where the Better Business Bureau really comes into play and really abdicates for folks, especially at the local level. When you are looking to shop, and let's say you found some really distinct product that you're not seeing at the major retailers, you're seeing it more at these boutique type websites. And you go there and then all of a sudden, three months passes by, four months, five, you still haven't received product and you've been trying to contact them and there's no resolution there. A lot of times when you go to the BBB, you can file a complaint there and the BBB will look to contact them or basically require them to respond to it. So that's one way. The other thing is, is the Federal Trade Commission is really where we're going to go to to file any complaint when it comes to products, whether it's undeliverable or if it's the wrong thing or it's broken and you're not getting resolution from the company directly. Um, and that actually brings me to a good point with the Better Business Bureau. When you are looking to shop at your more small business boutique websites, um, unlike your big retail chains, which are a little bit more reputable, you want to do your due diligence and Google search and look at the reviews and look at other sites that provide reviews. You're going to want to go to the BBB. You're going to want to look at their local scam tracker and really see, is this a reputable website for me to purchase from? Because a lot of times you will see when you go to research some uh, website and that's not legit, the biggest complaints are undeliverable product, non-reachable, bad customer service. And it just, not only are you putting yourself at risk for potential fraud down the line, but you're also just, you know, you're, you're spending money and not receiving anything. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's like you could be opening it up to potential future fraud, but you're really in that moment you're not getting anything out of it either. So when I think about the ads that are served up to us on social media that take us to some of these boutique sites, the comments are not an accurate reflection of reviews. They either turn comments off on the ads yeah. or there are people who are saying, oh, I would like to try this. Oh, this looks neat, but it's not actual people who've ordered it and used it most of the time in those ads. No, and that's where a lot of times when you go to look at reviews, a lot of times you want to look for like verified purchaser or verified review because that lets you know like this email is linked to an actual bought product and this is someone saying like this is a le legit review because yeah, there are people that do pay services for fake reviews and it just, it leads the consumer down a road where it's like, okay, now I can't even trust reviews. You can, you just got to really hone in and look for the right places. So how do we spot fake websites? Because whether it's a boutique website or another website that's posing as, I mean, you know the emails we get from the Amazons of mm -hmm. the world that aren't the Amazons. So how are we able to spot those websites that are fake, that are fraudulent? So there's some go-to uh, tips that I like to say when you're first looking at the website. The biggest thing is in that search bar engine at the top where the URL is, you're gonna wanna look for HTTPS 
and that S is basically standing standing for that it's a secure website to shop with. So that's a big thing. And also with that, you're looking always for that padlock icon. So it's the little lock icon. You it's, see on the, it's on the right. Yes, yes usually, usually it's overall the right. way on the right. Yeah. And the thing is, is that Google a lot of times will automatically flag any site that doesn't have that HTTPS because they don't consider that a secure website to, to shop on. So they will even let you know right away, like that's not secure. We don't really trust it, but you know, user beware. So a lot of times look for that HTTPS, look for the padlock icon. Also, when you're looking at the website, look for clues, like look for misspellings, look for errors, look for anything that's a little bit off because that's gonna tell you right away, this is a little, you know, I'm not comfortable shopping here or too good to be true sales. Things that, you know, you're looking at other sites and what their product is placed at uh, monetarily. And then you're looking at here and it's a little bit too good to be true. That should be a red flag to you. And then the biggest thing too is the privacy policy. It could be listed on the home page, or it could be listed somewhere else on a different page, but it lets you know like what information you are providing maybe at checkout that that website's going to keep um, and, and utilize later down the road. So the way we shop has changed also from just using websites. Now there are apps where I can purchase clothes and gifts inside those apps. And some of them are well-known and some of them aren't as well-known. Some of them I use Apple Pay, some I can use PayPal, right? What do I need to know about that as I head into this shopping season? I wanna say that when you're looking at shopping through apps, you're definitely gonna have greater success when it comes to those apps that exist with big major retailers like your shines and your asos there it's just they're basically creating a, an easier way for you to get their product versus going onto your phone opening up their website now they're like here just go into our app quick efficient it's still secure it allows for multiple ways to pay and if there's an issue they run into any security issues a lot of times there's you know ways for you to have two factor authentication I always mispronounce that word, but it allows you, you know, to basically say like, I'm secure in purchasing from here. Some of your other apps that are maybe linked to major influencers or other people online could be a little bit wary, but look at it just like looking at a fake website, like look for security, look for ways that it's letting you know that this app is secure and also do some major, you know, due diligence and research prior to purchasing through it as well. Um, look to see what the complaints say about, again, undeliverable product or look for, you know, payment um, not processed or refund not issued. People are very much if I didn't receive something or if I basically did not have a good customer service experience, they're going to let you know about it. Like people are not shy at letting <laughs> other cons potential consumers know this is not a website or a company you want to work with. So I always say trust those reviews, but also know that some people are a little, a little, um, high maintenance or high expectation where there might be some reviews where you're like, okay, let's you know pull back a little bit. But for the most part, when someone says like, I wouldn't shop here, didn't receive something or customer service is bad, or I'm getting weird phone calls now after I purchased from them, take it for what it is. You know, it's- If a company is showing you who they are, believe yes, them. believe them. Believe them. Right. So kind of along the lines of, you know, those emails that we are getting just left and right from retailers this season to purchase a gift from them, or even some of the texts that we get, because, mm -hmm. you know, that is used by, I I'm thinking of some beauty retailers that do it right now who want to buy their holiday gift package and send a text to my phone because I've purchased from right. them before. What do we need to keep in mind with these emails and texts when it comes to phishing? So phishing emails, it's it's one of those things where, I mean, for the most part, you can really tell when a phishing email is what it is. It's There's going to be the email that the um, that you're receiving, the sender email is going to be totally not what a legitimate company would use to send emails from, or there's going to be a lot of misspellings or just the grammar is going to be off. But then there's really some scammers that take their time in creating emails that really trick people. And it could be like the littlest thing, like the logo just slightly off or the, the, the person's just not paying attention to the sender email. And they go ahead and they just, they click. They click on a link and the link might not even take them anywhere, but the link just itself is compromised. It's now putting, you know, some, some kind of tracking um, device on your phone. And, and when I say tracking, it's not like watching where you're going, but it may be tracking, you know, 
information you're putting into your phone. Yeah. Similar to if you're using computer, it could be looking for tracking or inputting or looking for when you input personal information like addresses, social security numbers, um, credit card information. They're, they're looking for anything they could grab to basically you know, commit fraud from. So those are just things that you want to think about when you're looking at phishing emails. Um, and the thing is too, is you mentioned we get those phishing texts or smishing as they call shmishing, them. Smishing, yeah, that's what it's called. Um, and it can be from a retailer. It could be from a quote unquote financial institution or bank. I mean, we still get rec- complaints come in from, uh, come to us through OCA where someone's saying, I don't even bank with Chase, but Chase is sending me this, you know, the scam. And I'm like, well, it's not Chase. It's a scammer pretending to be Chase sending you something that's trying to get you to click on a link. So that is something that's going to continue to uprise throughout the holiday season. But what's really something to think about too, is that because Inflation is an issue this holiday season, and because companies are really trying to provide the best customer service they can to folks, they're probably going to be more apt to offer free shipping opportunities. And free shipping is great, but free shipping allows for a different amount or a plethora of mail carriers to basically come in on board. So maybe you're used to just like the United States Postal Service, or maybe you're just used to UPS, or maybe you're used to you know FedEx. But now maybe some of these companies are using DHL or some other you know servicers, and maybe they do send text message alerts letting you know that your package is arriving or it's on track or something, or maybe they don't. But you wouldn't know that. So a lot of times. I always tell people to pay attention to shipping notifications through text because that is where they could really get you because it could be very vague, like shipment on the way, click here for updates or something just like issue with product, not, you know, undeliverable, click here or anything like that. And people are quick to be like, oh, I'm expecting holiday stuff. And you're not really thinking like, when did I possibly purchase something or where is this from or what mail carrier is it going to be coming from? So you just click. And again, you're opening your, yourself up to any you know potential fraud down the line. Yeah, I mean, it's overwhelming to think about the number of websites we might visit for gifts and then just living our normal lives. Right. So you, you are going to want to say, oh, this must be on the way. Right. Yeah, no, that's a very good point to consider that. We have so many options to choose from when purchasing gifts. I mean, a lot of us are at the point where we're doing much of our shopping online. But what do you think really are the best options that are out there? I mean, retail versus the online versus app. Like, mm-hmm. how do you feel about all of it in your world, where you're coming from? So when it comes to where you're purchasing, whether it's brick and mortar or if it's online, the, the thing is it's you're going to have risk no matter what you do, whether you're shopping in person or not, or if you're shopping online. But I always say if you don't have control over where you're going to go to shop location-wise or online, at least use the best option to purchase. So for instance, I talk about credit cards a lot because I educate on financial literacy and I always want to want folks to be responsible credit card users because credit cards are beneficial if used correctly. They're also more protected based on a federal law. If you were to be scammed, someone takes your credit card literally out of your pocket or somebody gets your information because you inputted it on a website that wasn't secure and now they have your credit card info and then they go and on a shopping spree under on that credit card. And then you look at it and you're like, wait, this is not me. And you file the police report or you say, you know what, I'm not even gonna do that. I'm gonna go straight to the credit card company and say that this isn't me. And the credit card company looks into it and they're like, yeah, this isn't. So let's look, let's look into it. You are more apt to get that money returned to you because of the federal law. You're just protected in that sense. That availability is not transparent. It's not across the board. Debit cards don't offer the same protection. Peer-to-peer apps or money transfer apps definitely don't have that protection. Gift cards don't have that protection. So I always say if you want to be the most protected and secured in your payment, purchase through the credit cards. Got it. And sometimes people will say, but I don't want to swipe or insert it at the when you know I'm at the physical retail store or I'm still iffy about like typing it into my phone like what if I have a tracker on there or what if you know the website or the website I'm inputting my information is not protected okay well there's digital wallets 
So digital wallets is great. You can link your credit cards to the digital wallet and then you are just, you know, pulling it up in your phone and sending it that way. And someone's like, well, is that secure? It is. You're eliminating having to input credit card information and it allows you to then um, a lot of times confirm this is the credit card I want to use because they usually ask for that secure code or they, they ask for the zip code attached to the credit card, or they'll ask for your thumbprint if you have thumbprint identification on your, on your phone. So there's ways to even make credit card use even that much um, protected per se. Really want to talk to you more about this digital wallet thing, because is that basically what it's a brand, but is that what Apple Pay is? Is it a digital wallet? So Apple Pay is yes and no. So Apple Pay is a peer-to-peer -peer payment app, but it also offers digital wallet capabilities. So you are able to have a money transfer app on your phone and be able to have that security where you go right from your Apple phone and to purchase something. There are... The difference between like just a digital wallet is digital wallets, you can link multiple credit cards or debit cards or other forms of payment and allows you like, a, you know, a non-touchable way to transfer your funds. With peer-to-peer -peer apps, it's like its own entity that allows you to transfer funds from one phone to another phone or from one phone to a business. And as you just taught us, not protected. Not protected. If we make some holiday purchases yes. that don't come through for so, us. So... There's, there's hundreds upon hundreds of peer-to-peer -peer payment apps or money transfer apps available for folks to download and use. There are your reputable brands like your Google Pays and your Apple Pays and PayPal, and you even now have Zelle through a lot of your banks. But they all have different user agreements and they all have different buyer protector, uh, protections or buyer-seller protections. So some of the biggest complaints that we get through OCA concerning peer-to-peer -peer payment apps is this wasn't me and, or I sent this money thinking it was a legit company and it wasn't them. And now I want my hundred dollars back. And these peer to peer payment apps companies are like, um, did you read the user agreement? Like this is considered user error. So I really want to use a digital wallet then <laughs> if this holiday season. If I don't have one linked up, how do I do the right research to find what digital wallet might be right for me? So a lot of times your phones are like, if you, especially if you have like a Pixel phone or an iPhone or Samsung, they have it already built into the capability of the phone. And then there are websites that you can search um, or even I think like, you know, your reputable news outlets like Forbes and all of them, they've done great articles on digital walls to use if you don't have the capability through your phone that you can um, look to download and use with it. Um, but I would say a lot of times your phone's really going to direct you and be reputable and secure and not a problem to just use that. And when I go to checkout, I'll be prompted to enter from the digital wallet if I'm doing it online? Yes. Okay. Most of the time when you go to... Uh, Use your digital wallet through your phone with a like what uh, the website on your phone or the app that you're using to shop through. And it's gonna prompt. It's gonna be pulled up. It's gonna ask if this is the credit card or debit card you want to use. I always say go with the credit card. And then it's gonna ask for you know the secure code or the zip code or some other way to basically for, say this is legit me. And then you put in that information. And then you're able to have that you know verified secure purchase. So I'm going to use my digital wallet this holiday shopping season. I'm going to attach a credit card to it mm -hmm. because I am most protected probably with that combination mm -hmm. rather than using my debit card on the digital wallet. Yes. And I just need to prepare to obviously you would give me this advice to be able to pay off that credit card yes. once I have all my holiday gifts purchased. Yes, because, you know, another worry with inflation is, you know, there are folks that are already stretched. I mean, we are, we're not only are we affected on the retail level and at the grocery store, but we're affected, you know, just paying for our utilities at home or, you know, just gas prices. I mean, we see it across the board. People are already pretty stretched thin. So... Be a responsible credit card users. Don't fall victim to the let's just throw all of our holiday shopping on the credit card and worry about it later. Like, don't start off the new year with a lot of debt you don't need. Like, your loved ones know you love them. You don't need to go too crazy. But if you're going to use anything, credit cards are probably the best way. What do I do if I've been scammed? We started to touch on this, but now that we've talked about our, you know, debit cards or our peer-to-peer -peer payment, you know, payments being compromised, what do I what do I do if I've been scammed? So the first thing I always suggest folks mm -hmm. to do is file a police report. Um, your local police is, it, it's, 
people are like, well, what if it's only like $200? It's not really that big of a matter. It doesn't matter. Police reports always are helpful in proving to your credit card or debit card company that you have been scammed. And it's always useful when you go to file a complaint with the FTC because the Federal Trade Commission is the go-to place to file complaints about anything regarding scams. So the thing is, I always suggest that people go there because not only is are you letting others know that this is happening at this company or retailer, but it also, they keep track of all of this stuff and they keep us alert on trends that are happening. And this is the best way for me to educate Ohioans and consumers on how to protect yourself from potential fraud down the road. Um, the other thing is that you can report it to the Ohio Attorney General's office as well. So they're a go-to when it comes to complaints and they actually have logs of complaints of companies so that you're aware of what's um, happening on that level too. And then they also do suggest too that you can report fraud to the FBI. The FBI has a website, which is ic3.gov. IC3, like the letters I, C, mm -hmm. and the number three? Yep, okay. ic3.gov. And it's just another platform for them to see the complaints that come in because then they can dig deeper into some of the major, more high volume fraud that's happening across the US. Because this is an enterprise yes. for some for some countries, mm -hmm. for some criminal groups. I mean, I could see kind of that level of investigation that is beyond what we do here yes. at the Department of Commerce. I mean, I remember talking, I mean, every year I talk about holiday shopping and safe shopping online or even in the stores. And I've been asked, you know, why isn't there a website that shows us like the newest scam of today or tomorrow? I was like, we couldn't keep up. Like, this is how fast it happens. The turnover rates and the, I mean, scams happen continuously, minute by hour, by days. And the right when we get on board with something happening, it changes the next day or the next week or next month. So there's yeah. no way for us to completely be, you know, watching a tracker go and here's a new scam and this is how much money it is and this and this. That's why we rely on those complaints to have those by, um, quarterly reports and those end of the year reports. Real quickly before we wrap up, do you have any other go-to tips for this holiday shopping season? So a lot of times people kind of like, when I say my, my first tip, people kind of look at me like a little weird, but I always tell people to freeze your credit and they're like, freeze my credit. So like your three big credit card um, bureaus reporting websites, uh, TransUnion, F Equifax, and Experian, those are your three go-tos and that have your credit portfolios. It's also, you know, through them where, you know, you get credit checks done. And why give the opportunity for someone to, t to steal your private information and try to open a credit card under your name when you can just freeze your credit and doesn't give them the opportunity? You can freeze it indefinitely or you can freeze it from a time frame because someone's like, well, what was if I want to like take out a loan or buy a house or something? Like they need to do a credit check, unfreeze it and then freeze it back again. It just eliminates the temptation or even the opportunity for a scammer to open up a credit card or, or a loan in your name. And I know you have two other go-to tips for the holidays. Um, so always be sure to use your two-step authentication. Um, so a lot of people always think it's such a drag or it's just extra steps. Like I go to purchase something and then they want to send me a text with a code and I gotta input the code. And it's like, why do I have to do all this? It's more work for me. It's more work for you, but it's also more work for a scammer to get through. So it just eliminates them from having direct access to maybe your bank account or, or a account that you have with a, a company or something. So it allows you just better protection. And it also is a, cap a, a way for companies to also use it on their end, just so they make sure that they're creating a secure, safe platform for you to shop from as well. So always look for companies that use it or always utilize it um, when you can. And then the last thing, pretty simple, let's make sure that we have complex passwords, long <laughs> complex passwords, and we change them regularly, especially right before a big holiday shopping season. A lot of people always look at me like, I have so many passwords and I have to change them all the time. And I understand it sucks, but trust me, when a scammer gets a hold of one password that is convenient or really easy for them to navigate, and they try to see where you use it elsewhere, they will see where they use it elsewhere. And that's another thing. Some of the credit reporting websites 
can show you when a password or an email has been compromised as well from like maybe like a data breach or something. So I always say passwords are really important. People think that it's just so annoying, but it's really important to make sure that they're up to date and that they're complex and not one, two, three password. <laughs> Victoria has a lot of other tips at com.ohio.gov. Look under education and training, understanding finances. Victoria, thanks for being with us. Thank you. We'll see you next time on What Matters.